without further ado, Father Robert, let's let you go. Okay. Well, the first slide, uh, you can see it's quite a primitive slide. And I will show quite a few uh, images throughout the presentation. My reason for this is that um, I feel that when we talk about the gospel or anything like that, we need the emotions involved as well. So it's not just an intellectual pursuit, but it in, it's, it's our whole being in getting to know this being whom we call Jesus. Um, whom we see through our presentation is, uh, as we celebrate today, the Son of God, and uh, how we respond to him, how he works with us, and how he is so much part of the fabric of everyday life. So while the slide is primitive, there's a lot of color, and we're not working with an icon here, but later on I'll show you an icon, and the way we use icons in prayer is to look at the, the figures and to choose one that we feel represents us at this particular moment and, uh, and then we explore it that way but we're not going to explore that this morning. We just want this to invite us in this picture so that we may feel the presence of the Lord. And so I'd like to begin too with a, a little poem based on this is Take My Feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from thee. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my voice and let me sing always only for you, my King. Good. So let's venture into this uh, story of I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. I chose this particular slide to lead us in because uh, Hebrews 10.25 says, let us not give up meeting together. Well, I like the togetherness of this particular slide and picture because when we gather, as we are this morning, and every time we gather for Eucharist or anything in the parish, it's always because we have a relationship with other believers. Although we are individuals, we still belong to one another. Slides to introduce us, of course. Worship, it's all about him. So we know that worship is an act of God that we cooperate with in order to offer sacrifice to him so that we may know him, love him, and serve him more fully. So this is where we're going to spend a lot of our time today, sitting at the table with Jesus. And as you can see, the look that he has on his face is almost inviting us in. Come be with me. I want you to be by my side. I want to share my father with you and show you what this great mystery is that I want to reveal to you. And that's where we go. So the great mystery has been revealed. This is what we proclaim as church. You are much more than this life you are currently living. So we hope that through this presentation that you'll be able to come to an understanding that life has a lot to offer, even though we are going through this pandemic. And what is it that inspires us? What is it that draws us out of ourselves, allows us to allow the divine in, and how we can also be open to one another? So there is a mystery about you that is just beginning to be revealed. We may be my age, um, I'm quite old now, but a lot has been revealed to me over the years. And even now I find that God opens up avenues, not only of thought, but of prayer, um, adjustment within myself, again, an invitation to live more fully than I have lived. And we know that this, you'll see from one of my sites, it never stops. And the, the mystery is basically this. You are deeply loved by someone with the power and might of the universe. This is what we want to explore. This mysterious one, now the word mystery, I want to use in the context of Karl Rahner, who says, 
that which is forever discoverable is not mysterious in the sense that you can't find out anything. We're constantly discovering God, and we're also constantly discovering ourselves. So take the whole life to explore who you are in the love that God shows you. And for us, it's just awesome. You know, how can this God who made this universe, when you look at how beautiful today is, how he made that, but then he also made you and me with intention. And not only made us, but he loves us. And we will, throughout our lives, constantly wonder, how come? What is it about me, Lord, that you love so much? And I hope you're going to discover some of that with me this morning. First of all, we look at God who is present in us. And we look at some of our scriptural texts from John. The eternal Father and the eternal Son will dwell in the person who keeps Jesus' word. This is what we're trying to do. Keep Jesus' word. And we somehow know that he lives within us. And then St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 3, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? And again in chapter 6, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? So it tells us of our great dignity, you know, that we actually carry God within us in many ways, you know, some of the saints actually said that they should genuflect to people because people have the Holy Spirit within them, <clears throat> which gives us a tremendous dignity. <clears throat> so <clears throat> today we celebrate the baptism of the Lord, and I'm sure in all the homilies you've heard, if you did hear any, uh, God comes to us in baptism to make us children of God. He never abandons us. He's always with us. And he is our constant companion. Another expression I like to use is fellow traveler. It's about you and me as being fellow travelers on the road to the finality of the kingdom. Um, but with us on our journey of life is our constant companion, God himself in Jesus, and who is there not only in events, but also the moments of our lives. He's with us right now. Do you believe this? Ah, <clears throat> there are times I actually stop myself and say, I can't believe this. How would God want to be with me in my little, little life? But the big thing is, he says, yes, I do, I do. So the great drama of human life then is, how can one small person possibly approach the mystery who created the stars? Well, we can't. The mystery approaches us. That's what I think is so wonderful about our God, is he makes the first move. He comes to us. And of course, it depends on how open we are to that reception. God, human spirit says, Jesus Christ, by the revelation of the mystery of the Father and his love, fully reveals man to man, sorry about the gender story, that's 1962, himself, and makes his supreme calling clear. So each of us has a particular calling and um, who is the mystery then? It is Jesus himself. The mystery was made known to me by revelation, says Paul. Let me talk about our risen Lord. His presence is trying to reveal himself to us today in our world, in our time, our personal circumstances. One of the themes that came up in our discussions of the sacred was solace. Scripture solace was, you know, even in this pandemic, how we've learned some things about ourselves, the good things about ourselves, the kindness of others, and how we also have revealed to others uh, a different way because of the challenges we face right now. So we have an awesome responsibility in a way, but it's a joyful one, you know, to reveal the risen presence of Jesus Christ in our time in our lives, in our world. So how does Jesus make himself present? Well, for us, certainly in the life of the church. Now, I like this picture. I think it's, um, I have to apologize that it's not gender friendly. 
um, but it's certainly culturally friendly. This is what we're trying to do as church, you and me, to follow Jesus and to listen to where he leads us and then put into practice those things that he teaches us. I love this description of, I mean, the, clearly the figures are following Jesus here. Jesus called people to a way of living. We know that from our following of him. The earliest members of, of the Jesus movement were known as followers of the way. That's what you and I are, followers of the way. Now I'm going to approach the mass in a very different way this morning. Um, because there are many things one can say about the Mass, we never exhaust the meaning of it. But we know this description of the Mass, that it is the central act of worship in the life of a Catholic. Going to Mass is about spending time with God, but also receiving His graces in a strength to live the Christian life. Now I'm going to look at the Mass almost as we have a meal. You know, when we invite people to the house, we never start eating immediately. We sit and talk for a while and we share with what's going on in our lives with one another. And uh, at Mass it's a little different. We uh, do start talking. God talks to us, we talk to God and you'll see how this spells out. And then we'll talk about when we eat, what is it that we do? So the name Mass comes from that final blessing in the old days, some of us will remember, ite missa est, meaning to send out. So as Jesus sent out his disciples to the world, uh, we take his teaching from the Eucharist, from talking to him and listening to him to our world, and more particularly transfer the information into our hearts, into our lives. Otherwise, it just stays a message there. We take it with us. So here are some responses to the Eucharist that may guide us today. In the sacred scriptures, I find nourishment that is solid and pure. Yes, indeed, St. Teresa of Lisieux, we do come for nourishment. We eat the bread and drink the wine. It nourishes our bodies, but of course, we also know that Jesus comes to us in the bread, because he is the bread of life to nourish us. Now, I'm not too familiar with Blessed Elizabeth of the Trinity, but somebody else has been talking to me about her quite a lot of late. So I found some things about her. She says, there is a being who is love and who wishes us to live in communion with him. That's why communion for us is so significant. And especially during the pandemic, many feel so deprived of the Eucharist and the sacraments. I spoke to Bishop uh, McGraw about that just the other day when he came here for a funeral at our church. And I said, he said, do people miss the communion? I said, I know. And I told him of somebody who stopped me in the parking area outside the parish center soon after the pandemic began. And she was in her car and she said, do you mind hearing my confession? I said, no, not at all. And when she finished, she said, thank you. All I wanted after all this time was a sacrament. And I know that there are many who really miss Holy Communion. Each of us has a destiny um, to have a living relationship with the divine presence, which we see, of course, in God, in Jesus, who comes to us in such a concrete way. So in terms of responding, then, so our faith asks us to take the leap and respond to the, the approach of the mystery. So they're the approach of God, the approach of Jesus. So if you look around you with wonder at the people and events of your life, isn't it amazing when you reflect, especially in your prayer time, the people who have touched your life in a very special way and who have brought you to life? We celebrate wedding anniversaries, ordination anniversaries. Now, those, at those times, we look back at how God's finger has been present there in the events of our lives and people. We are so fortunate. Of course, I'm not trying to uh, you know, paint a rosy picture of life. We all have our, our challenges as well, but it's because of the people we have known and we know, and because of God's event, uh, evidence in our lives, 
that we've been able to cope with that. He is there. I love this. Again, from Elizabeth of Trinity. He is there keeping me company, helping me. Now, the word to suffer, I want you not to sim simply think of something that is so hard and awful, but to suffer from the Latin word is to allow. So help me to allow the things of life, like the pandemic, for example, urging me to go beyond my suffering, to rest in him. And he does say that to us. Come to me, all you who labor and are burdened, and I will give you rest. How do we make time for this mystery? Something, some advice and inspiration from Mother Teresa. The fruit of silence is prayer. The fruit of faith is love. The fruit of love is service. The fruit of service is peace. Well, it's easier said than done, isn't it? But it's something to think about and reflect on and pray about. Jesus is my only love. Jesus is my all in all. Jesus is my everything. Because of this, I am never afraid. So I think one of the things you probably want to say to me is, no, yeah, but that's fine for Mother Teresa. But I'm just an ordinary human being. I'm not a saint like she is. Well, we know that in her humanity, she suffered a great deal too. Um, but she always looked for peace. And she found it, of course, in Jesus. Another picture of people gathering. Um, this is what we do because we believe us. And this time we have all the genders and all the races of the world and cultures. We call that fellowship, koinonia. So the belief in Jesus as Lord and Messiah transformed the early believers from a collection of disparate individuals into a single body with a corporate identity and a shared purpose. So that's what we have, is that shared purpose. All right, so what do we do in terms of life? Well, we watch. We watch other people. We watch people come to Mass. We watch people in our world. We wait. We pay attention, in prayer especially, to get ready for an extraordinary adventure where this divine mystery, this divine God, leans over towards you and me and invites us to have a life with him. What is about going to Mass that moves people? Well, you know, I did a study for the Pastoral Council a little while ago. And um, do we go because the music is meaningful, the homily? You know what I found out? That the most significant part of the Mass for most people, believe it or not, is the homily. Um, and I was just amazed at that in a survey that was done, that, that came out as the most. So we do go to Mass for the homily because the homily, the, the presider tries to take the scriptures and translate them into how it can be meaningful for our daily lives. We have music because again, when we gather for, when people come to our homes, I don't know about you, but I always have light classical music in the background. When we come to Mass, music is important. Because it, again, it involves our emotions. It involves the joy. We also have quiet, because that's the time that we pray, especially after communion. But the drama is there, and we'll talk more about the drama in the course of this presentation. So again, we go back to the word mystery, that which is forever discoverable, of the Father's love expressed through the love of Jesus Christ Church. So it's not in Jesus only to us. It's also the love that we show and express towards one another. What's important, you know, when we gather for a Mass, the, our talking together, if you like, the initial stage of our coming together, is we like to hear the scriptures communally. Sometimes I think maybe there's too much scripture because you can't comment on everything. And that's why fortunately we have this cycle of three years. And some of these texts will come back 
and we'll be able to look at them differently, but it's community. And when we're sharing the stories of our faith and of one another, we do it together. That's why we have a living room where we sit together. So tradition tells us that the way we have learned throughout history as a church to interpret the scriptures together. Many people will perhaps say, well, well you know, I can read a scripture at home. Well, we can, but we want to hear it together as a community, as a family. Uh, when you gather as families, don't you often tell stories of where you've been, where your grandmother was born, your grandfather came from? That's part of sharing, and we do that when we come together to hear the scriptures. It also helps us to deepen our understanding of the scriptures and also safeguard, safeguards our experience of God's communication with us. God never stops talking. He's always communicating with us. So here we are, the word of God. And you remember the prophets always said, uh, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. That's what we want to do at Mass. You know, and I'm, I'm not saying you can pay attention all the time to every word, but things will jump out at you from the proclamation of the scriptures. When I was at O'Connor, we had Mass every day at 12. The sacristan would also say, we don't have a reader today. And I said, no, I don't want a reader. I want a proclaimer. So when the words are proclaimed, we listen. And words here and there stay with us. It's almost like going to a play or a musical, rather. And we become out singing a tune. Sometimes hearing the word of God, we focus on a particular word or a particular sentence and it stays with us. We take it with us during the day. The word of God, again, I'm just showing the pictures just to emphasize that it is God's word. The words themselves are the word of God. That's why we finish off the scriptural text by saying the word of the Lord. I love this picture. Look how simple it is. People gathered around a table they're talking to each other, sharing perhaps, they're not just praying, but sharing the, the interpretation of text. When I was chaplain to the university students of Pretoria University in South Africa, we had mass every Sunday evening at 6.30. And it was in a simple room, something like this. And I would start the homily, but then, I open up the homily for a shared homily. And then the students would share with me what they saw meaningful in the gospel or in the other readings and how to apply to their lives. So just by sharing, we were able then to gain deeper insight into where God is in fact wanting to lead us. I love that simplicity, don't you? I know our churches are more sophisticated than that, but it's have us in the same atmosphere. We sit together and we hear. The living God, of course, is powerful. This is what Pope Francis said about the word. The Bible is the book of the Lord's people who in listening to it, move from dispersion and division towards unity. The word of God unites believers and makes them one people. One final slide then here about the word. As the grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of God stands forever. I've shared with some people that, you know, I had an aunt when I was a little boy who told me that the Catholics don't have a Bible. And I said, what? <laughs> and as you know, of course we do. And then as I grew to understand the Bible more, I kind of shared with her one day, you know, the, the, the Bible that other people believe in came from us. Okay. So now we're sitting together, of course, at our homes when people visit. And when we gather, we share and talk. But then we also get to the point where we eat. So eating is also an important part. That's why we invite people to our homes. That's why Jesus invites us to the church. It's a memorial. And this idea of memorial is very significant 
to us because it talks about a covenant. And you hear that word often at mass and in prayers. But the covenant was basically Israel's life and worship uh, and their connection with God. We know that is, the idea of sacrifice also enters into this whole memorial that Israel's ritual and cultic expression of her relationship with God was in fact through the meals, through eating. And that's why the Passover meal is so significant and important. This is a very significant part of the memorial for the Jewish people and also now for us because it comes to us right from that Passover meal. So the memorial makes real in the present. This is what the Jewish people believed. God's faithfulness, his mercy, and his saving love. So it's not just historical. It is now, it is real, and it is present. We remember, of course, Israel's final meal before they left uh, Egypt on their way to the Promised Land, that they ate the lamb uh, with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. And there's that picture I showed you earlier of Jesus with the disciples, that's exactly what he was doing at the Last Supper. And there's some more visuals coming on that. On their way to the Promised Land, and when they were in the Promised Land, they were to have this meal to remember the event with a similar meal, but always to remember that it was God saving in the present, not just an historical event. There you are. Isn't that just lovely? Jesus with the disciples having a simple Passover meal. It's during that meal that he connected to them in an intimate way by offering himself to them. This is my body. This is my blood. Again, I go to the students. I remember one East before we one Easter during Lent, we decided to have a Passover meal and incorporate the Eucharist within that. And we sat around a table like this. And it was friendly, we chatted away, and then we had some readings, and then we ate something, and then we went into the, the Eucharist itself. It's really lovely. What I like about this is to remember, this is what we are when we go into the church. Although we're sitting in pews these days and not on cushions like they are there, we're sitting around that table. And right in the middle is Jesus, our host inviting us to come and enjoy this meal with him. So what they did, Jesus, at that time, and the Jews still to today, their memories of deliverance is uh, real in the terms of what they eat, the bitter herbs, the salt water, the egg. So again, not just remembering an event of the past, it's a present experience. Every time they celebrated that meal, they said, the Lord has delivered us from the slavery. So for them, it's happening now. What happens now at Eucharist for us is about what we want to explore. Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. So not just the past event. So the memory is Jesus has freed them from slavery of sin. That's what we basically say. Jesus, you have freed us from sin. You invited us to be your brothers and sisters, to be part of your family. And this idea of remembering then is the timelessness of it all. So um, I'm going to come to this a little later. This is what saddens me when I hear people say, mass is boring. That's why I don't go. And um, you'll see later, I will say, it's not always an emotional experience. But if we keep in mind that the mystery that we are part of is that Jesus is there saying, I'm with you, not just of the, in the Last Supper, I'm with you now. So it is past, present, and future, merged into one eternal moment. I always like to refer to that as God's eternal now. He is with us now. Right, now here's an icon of Jesus at the Last Supper. And again, the icon, if we use this, for example, in prayer, we say, now, where am I in this picture? How do I feel? 
and where would I place myself in the picture? A favorite of mine, of course, is John, right next to Jesus. And I shared with you in a homily quite recently that with a crib, we can also put our heads on the crib, because we want to feel the heartbeat of Jesus, uh, to be close to him, knowing that it's a loving heart, then our hearts also beat in tune with his, and we experience the thrill of being loved, not rejected, so embraced, and so worthy, as we heard today in our scriptures. We're all worthy of God's love because of what Jesus has done, inviting us to be his brothers and sisters. And even in moments that we feel shame and sorrow, that's when he is most present to us, to assure us that we are worthy of his love. So this is what uh, we talk about the sacrifice. Of course, we know the sacrifice is the sacrifice of Calvary. And I'll talk a little more about that later. But this is what Paul II said. The sacrifice is so decisive for the human race that Jesus offered it and returned to the Father only after he had left us a means of sharing in it as if we had been present there. Some of the images I'll show you is we are present in the presence of Jesus in all that he did for us in terms of his sacrifice, in all the things that he says to us in the Gospels. That's why we read them first. It is love, embrace, and sharing. And of course, you know, when I hold up the host here, uh, when we have our outside masses at the car park, many times, like this morning, the sun is beaming down. I always see that as the kind of light. Sometimes it's too bright. Uh, but, you know, when I hold up the host uh, after the consecration, the light shines through like this, because this presider clearly is a bishop. But isn't it amazing that in a simple form of bread, that Jesus comes to us, he brings us God and the power of God's spirit. So we don't only just remember in our minds, we also try to remember by doing. So the Eucharist, as we know, is the memorial of Jesus' sacrifice. We gather to remember him and to remember that sacrifice and then represent the sacrifice. It's made present for us. We share through the action of the priest and the power of the Holy Spirit. I've shared with you that once I was standing at the back of church getting ready for mass, when a lady came up to me, she had in fact been a student with me at Santa Clara University. She said, I don't like you dressed up like this. So I said, why not? I'm not dressed up for any, just to dress up. She says, it's, it's, you separate from us like that. I said, no, I don't. For me, when I put on the vestments, it's I lose myself. I forget about me because the vestments represent what I'm going to do. I'm going to represent Jesus in the community. I know it sounds a bit pious, but you know, it's true. I must disappear. I mean, we always have that in scripture. You know, he must appear, I must disappear. John said that. So the priest represents the Jesus as the host of that particular meal. And then the doing comes here. What does Jesus do? We do exactly what he did. He breaks the bread, we have the wine, and... Um, we often reflect on that whole idea of breaking. He's breaking his body to share with us. Uh, I do love this uh, image as well. And it looks serious in a way, but I just think it's peaceful and so gentle. And he's thinking clearly of his father, wanting to communicate the father to us through the breaking of bread. I like this one too, because of all the different people. And what I like about it is there are a lot of young people here. I'm sad that, um, you know, even in my own family, that some of my young nieces and nephews don't um, think that mass is significant or important for them. And, um, but they are respectful. 
and they do have the gospel values, but I wish they'd come and eat with me at the table of Jesus. I want to talk about Eucharistic people because I think this is what this picture represents. To be a Eucharistic people means to draw on the Holy Spirit dwelling within us and actively join ourselves, our prayers, with those of Jesus Christ to the Father as we are members of his mystical body. So at, at Mass, we are able to stand mystically at the foot of the cross and witness for ourselves the same self-sacrifice of Jesus in an unbloody manner. You know, when I stand on the platform here celebrating Mass in the car park, I've shown some of you, if I look right across at the hills in the distance, they're pylons up there, but they look like crosses. And there are three of them I look out for all the time. So when it's cloudy, I feel disappointed and deprived. But like today, I looked up again. I said, there they are on the hill. We are present at the foot of the cross of that sacrifice Jesus offered. One of my favorite images of how he does offer that to us. We notice he looks up to the Father and he says, Father, if they don't believe that you love them, I don't know what more to do. I give them, give everything to you. I want them to know that I do that out of love for them. That's how we stand, as families beneath the mystical cross. Of course, Jesus is risen. So it's not just the sacrifice, the dead Jesus, the live Jesus we are experiencing there. That lovely light. Like this morning, I saw that light um, looking over the hills. So we I use other words. It's a celebration. We don't go there, well, this is about a sacrifice, therefore I've got to be all serious and that sort of thing. No, it's a celebration. That's why we sing, we greet each other when we arrive. Um, I, I remember an old priest when I was a boy, if there's too much noise in the church, he says, you know, this isn't a marketplace. It's our place. That's why we say hi. We talk, we share, how are you? And if things are not so well, I pray for you at Mass. That's why it's an active participation of all that come together in the place of worship. We're actively there. We want to be there. We come embracing the grace that Jesus pours out from us and sheds upon us through his cross. The hill of Calvary. The light, hope, look towards the future, the sunrise, and Jesus says, do this in memory of me. So do this in memory of me. We do the memory of the uh, Passover supper, of course, but this kind of memory is different. Jesus changed the whole dynamic of the Passover meal. His followers celebrate the meal in memory of him who freed us from the slavery of sin. Isn't that lovely? If you really thought about who you are, who God is, and how much thanks you owe him, you would want to go to Mass. The Mass would become the source and center of your spiritual life. I was thrilled to read this. And um, it's not just because I'm a priest that the Mass is so significant to me. Uh, it really is. And when I'm at a conference or something like that, I go to Mass. And usually because I don't have the time between flights to say Mass. And I don't want to say Mass by myself. It's always a community. So I want to do that. And it's nice to be sitting in the pews with my fellow brothers and sisters, celebrating the great love, the great mystery of God's love for us. So then the Mass is a meal. Like at home, when people come to a meal, we've had the chat, we've got caught up on all the business of life, and now we come to the meal. 
And so at the consecration and the, for the bread and wine, that's how we have the body and blood of Christ. I came, um, I came across the whole idea of Jesus, you know, he, he said, this is my body which will be given for you, that the word given up, um, in, in other words, basically he says, I would give up my life for you and with the blood uh, which will be poured out for you, this pouring out shows that it is a blood of sacrifice, absolutely everything. And that's what we find on the cross. Finally, when the soldier pierces the side of Jesus, the blood and water flow out. What we say is the sacramental life of the church, but it was the last drop of blood. Um, and thank God that the Jesus we receive, of course, is the risen Lord. So now when we receive this communion, we, of course, receive Jesus himself. He is the food of our soul, our spirit. And he said this very plainly. My flesh is true food. My blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Wow. Again, a stained glass window. Symbolic for us as Catholics. The center of everything is the Eucharist because it puts us in touch with the mystery. That we are loved by God and we make up the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. And we already share in eternal life. We share in God's life now and will for all eternity. What I like about this is mom and dad holding their little girl's hand or it could be a little boy. But I thought I saw a little bit of nail polish on the finger and that's why the little girl. Isn't that nice? Is a family receiving perhaps first communion? Maybe we should think of that for our first communion. Wonderful. So what are the benefits of Holy Communion for us? Well, first of all, it strengthens our union with Jesus. He lives within us in a very special way. Um, so whenever you're looking for him and you're not near a church, you've got him right there inside you. It increases our love of God and our neighbor. And this is what I wanted to share with you. So it's not always a deeply emotional experience. We don't come out of every single mess on our high. Sometimes we do. But it is always an experience of the Lord giving himself to us in his word and in his sacramental presence and then calling forth our self-giving in return. He invites us to give us of ourselves to him. So that's what we do in our prayer. You know, it's explosive power, all that stuff of God. Now I'm just going to go, I'm going through quickly through this slide and the next, only because I'm going to deal with each of those things individually. These are the benefits for our going to have a meal with Jesus going to visit him in his house, our house. Participation in the salvation of the world. We help with salvation of the world because of Jesus. So he's invited us to share the experience of the world's salvation and the death and resurrection of the Lord every time we celebrate. So you know, every time we leave Mass, we are cleansed and renewed because we've been at the central salvific event of history. The crucifixion, death and resurrection of Jesus. The Spirit goes with us. We are invited to participate in God's redeeming act each time we participate in the Eucharist. And we commit ourselves to working for God's reign. We will leave there, ite missa est, take the message with you. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Let us go and proclaim the gospel by our lives. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. From the Psalm 133. That's what we're doing every time we go to Mass. That's why we miss seeing each other in the church. But we sing each other in cars. And we can wave at each other. And have Mass outside. St. Irenaeus said this, we experience the glory of God. The glory of God, he said, is the full is the human being fully alive. The human being fully alive is the one who is in Christ Jesus. 
I'm going to do another series, uh, not with a mask, but on the idea of being fully human, fully alive. Um, some fascinating information there through the words of John Powell. So this is what God wants the world to look like. Human beings who give of themselves to others in faith, hope, and love. That's why the homily is, in a way, significant. It's supposed to help us do that. And as a priest, I know we're not successful every time. And I, it's, it's, to me, one of the most difficult things of being a priest, not that I don't enjoy it, but it's difficult, is the preparation. How am I going to put this across? How can it be meaningful? How can it be interesting without resorting, of course, to gimmicks? To live for the glory of God. That's what St. Irenaeus said. That's what we live for, the glory of God. But when we do that, we, of course, are filled with God's glory. So it's an interactive experience. Here we are, the glory of God. We look around in nature, around us now on this lovely day. It's not so great today. It's also a discipline of faith. Human beings develop habits, and these patterns shape our lives. So I know one of my fellow priests gets up every morning at 4.30. I can't do that. But that's his habit. I have other habits. The discipline of worshiping God helps us to grow into being habitually adorers of God. So we want to make sure that that's part of our discipline of faith, that we worship God regularly. There we are, connection, being together. Wow. It also helps us to, to develop a moral life. So in the Eucharist, we take, we bless, we break, and we give, as Jesus did. Imitation of the Lord's passion, death, and resurrection. So that's what that breaking is all about. Break your body. Body of Christ. So when you come out for communion, and I say body of Christ, I'm actually not saying that this is the body of Christ. I'm saying you are the body of Christ, and through this you become this body of Christ. If we celebrate faithfully, we ought to be conforming more and more as individuals and as community to the image of generosity and love of the one into whom we were baptized. So if we don't come to Mass, we miss out on this instruction on how we can live our lives better. Not... Uh, coercing in any way, but we want to choose that because we know it is good for us. It teaches us what is right, what is wrong, how we can develop a, a closer relationship with God. The purpose of morality is to teach you not to suffer and die, but to enjoy yourself and live. It's also about companionship. That's why if we look at the Latin word cum, with and panis, bread. It's uh, companionship. It's the bread of life. We find companionship in sharing food with others. I believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world, God incarnate, who has given his very self for me. Then I want to share in the most intimate experience of self-giving, Holy Communion, and I also want to recognize him in the brothers and sisters with whom I'm sharing the act of self-giving. That's why the Eucharist is so beautiful, I think, and believe. Look at that. Look at that sharing and giving and becoming God's people. I think it's so beautiful. Again, the parish community. All shapes and sizes, ages and nations come together as God's family to receive the bread of life. Again, another picture, family life, being together. And also focusing my needs. This is why we have the, the prayers of the faithful. So from the early days, men and women have brought their deepest needs and desires to the table of the Lord. We all do that individually. Confident that they can be joined to Jesus' great act of intercession before the Father. So when the priest holds up the bread, 
I th that's the time that I put all my stuff in that pattern as well. I try to remember the things that I want some help with in my life, knowing that if I can offer that with Jesus to the Father, the Father will help me. And um, decide, help me decide what I need to do about some of the concerns I have, but also how I can better my love and my charity. I can bring my deepest desires to the table of the Lord, confident I will be heard. He will hear my needs. What you need, bring to the table. We also pray for the world. And, most, and our general intercessions basically do that, but then we also personalize that by mentioning the sick and those who have died in our community. So in every celebration, the realities of our world, bread, wine, men, women, are transformed into the body and blood of Christ. It's not just the bread and wine on the altar that is transformed, it is you and me. The world with all of its time, we celebrate needs, joys, and struggles that's present in every Eucharist that we celebrate. So we pray for the nations. As we did today, we pray for our nation, especially the changes that are going to happen in the next few weeks. We need God's prayer to help us to recognize one another as brothers and sisters, as the people of God. And then we welcome the kingdom. The reign of God looks like human beings, you and me, who recognizing our sinfulness know that God's mercy is far greater. You remember that St. Augustine said, you cannot sin enough to stop God loving you. Isn't that amazing? He said that once to somebody who felt so awful about his life. And I didn't know if it had any impact, but years later he said to me, you know, I found my way because you told me of what St. Augustine said. You can never sin enough to stop God loving you. And the other thing that St. Augustine said, I used that recently in the homily, is that if you were the only person in the world, well, God loves you as if you were the only person in the world. Mm -hmm. So the reign of God looks like people, you and me, who allow God's Holy Spirit to form us into a community that accepts life from God. We believe that. We bless God with everything that is within us. Our brokenness is poured out. Our goodness is offered. Everything we have is offered in imitation of the Lord Jesus, who has given us this pattern of life that we try to live. Don't do it perfectly, but we do our best to live up to it. There we are, all of us, joyful, happy, happy people of God. Isn't it exciting? All on our way to the kingdom. Pure joy. So many times we find the deepest peace and joy from celebrating the mystery of God's love for us sharing his divine life. We enjoy fellowship, being together, because our sharing is with our brothers and sisters. I love this last question though. How could that not be the cause of pure joy? So that's what I want to say when people say, oh, it's boring. I said, oh, I know sometimes it's boring, but look at what we do there and how joyful we can make our lives and that moment. So there's Jesus preparing a meal for you and me before we arrive at Mass. He may not look like that, but it's just a lovely idea that he prepares the table. He's there before we get there, and he's preparing everything for us. And this is my very last picture. Look at that, in, that invitation. And look at that, offering me bread and wine how could I refuse? How could you refuse? How could we ever refuse? Amen. All right, Dennis, over to you.
Well, Corey, over to you. Yes. Hi, uh, Father Robert. So uh, we wanted to thank you for that presentation. We've got some questions. And if any of you have not um, submitted a question on the, the Q&A section, um, you can do so now, and we will address that there. Um, so a couple of, of points. Um, you talked about this concept of memory that shows up in the in the the mass here. Memory uh, that that term um, there's that term anamnesis, right? And that speaks of this kind of memory as being different than our normal sense of memory. And you were already, you were talking about that how it brings the past forward so that we ritually engage the past in in the present um we get a concept from from our our jewish forebearers who who um uh, who when they celebrate their passover seder it's not just their ancestors who are liberated from egypt but they themselves that who are are liberated from from egypt and we experience that same thing as you mentioned um you also talked then about the idea of past, present, and future in one moment. And so um, that I, the anonymous is that different kind of memory doesn't just bring the past forward, but also the, the future backwards so that we can participate in the future um, already, you know, it, ritually participate in it. And so I wondered if you would speak to that um, the eschatological dimensions of the mass as it as it looks toward forward towards the the heavenly banquet that mm -hmm. we can celebrate at the end of time there. Yes, that's why uh, you know the um, going out for communion, for example, it is um, not just the people on the march to the promised land, but very much uh, we're walking in this life and in this world towards the kingdom. The future. We don't know what that future is, but we do know that as Jesus is, we shall be like him. We pray that uh, you know, at funeral masses. So what we take with us from that meal is we go out back to where we live and move and have our being at home, in our workplaces, and we try and live as people with our focus on the kingdom that will be that's already now, but is growing and will be finally established the second coming of Jesus. That's why you, you will also read that in the prayers. It's the looking forward towards the second coming um, of our Lord. So we're a people who are moving forward. And that's, I think, the, the whole idea of the eschat eschatology, second coming of Jesus. That's, that's great. No, I I know that that's been a um, that that's a significant aspect in in that mass there, and the yeah. that even the the Church of Hagia Sophia in in um, what is now Istanbul, was Constantinople, that the the dome was there to create the feeling of of heaven, to symbolize that sense of being present in heaven while being at the at the mass, yes. The Orthodox would say the divine liturgy, but <laughs> it is divine. <laughs> it is. Yeah, it's wonderful. Uh, you mentioned this concept of being free from slavery to sin, in that, in that, in removing us from sin, Jesus allows us to be a part of His family. Um, just wanted to, to see if you can get some give some clarification about that. There's some question: Does does this mean that when we sin, we're not a part of uh, the family? That it's the being a part of Jesus' family is conditional. Um, I'm I'm sure. I mean, you, <laughs> yes, you know, that's not the case. But some people may have have some questions about that. Um, and you could you speak to that in light of what you were talking about with Saint Augustine there and his? Yes, you know, I mean, we all. Are aware that we are still under the influence of uh, uh, the original sin of selfishness, and that um, 
That's why at the Eucharist, we have the penitential rite. So we're able to say, well, let me look at my life and see, uh, am I living up to what I profess that I am, the body of Christ? It's, um, and then also with the, the absolution that comes with it um, is very helpful to us. But more than that, we're actually present at the very event of salvation. So all of us, when we leave Mass, we leave redeemed as redeemed people. And um, I think when we say, I confess, it's simply saying, Lord, I, I'm not as good as I would like to be. So I think it's more progressive in that sense than saying, Lord, I'm not worthy. I know some people struggle with the Lord, I'm not worthy, especially people who come from the Protestant tradition and join us. They say, I am worthy. I am made worthy by Jesus. And they say, well, you guys, the Lord I am not worthy is not saying I'm not worthy. It's quoting scripture of uh, the centurion. Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come to my house. So we say, Lord, I'm not worthy. And even though I'm not worthy, you come to me. And, and that's, that's a gift. Um, you know, if, in a way, after leaving Mass... Do we really need to go to confession? I'd say, yes, of course we do. Because the Mass cleanses us. But when we go to the sacrament of reconciliation, it's a more intimate way of saying, I've sinned against the community as well. And I want to have myself cleansed of that. Well, even though we may feel unworthy, God does not see us as unworthy. He wants us to become part of his family. And so I'm, I'm sad when people say I'm too sinful to, become, to go to Mass. Well, go to Mass and become less sinful. Cleanse yourself, renew yourself, heal yourself. And then look at the words, I'm not worthy to enter my roof, save that the word of my soul shall be healed. And it's healed. Is that enough? No, thank you. It related to that idea um, of, of how in mass makes us worthy and prepares us for life how you know circling back around to it can we prepare ourselves what, what are some good ways that we can prepare ourselves from for participation in the mass um, yes you know i many years ago I, I did a presentation about the elements of the mass and i said you know the the opening hymn actually begins at home. And the procession begins when you get in the car. Because the hymn is, you know, I don't know about you, but when I'm shaving, you know, I'm thinking of, well, Mass is coming now, and I'm already preparing myself there. It's like my opening hymn is <laughs> clearing my face. And um, I think just in the car, coming to Mass. Um, I know it's not always easy with small children, but if you simply say, you know, we're going to Mass, we're going to have uh, time with Jesus now, and he's with us here too, but there he's going to be with us in a very special way. Um, it could be a way of teaching children how to prepare the heart. It doesn't have to be pure silence or um, total devotion in prayer. I mean, we see that in the church with some people who feel that's how they want to do it. But we can do it in a very real human way. Even getting to cards say, well, <clears throat> this is the procession to Mass. Oh, is it, the talk I prepared was the domestic church. I always had this idea that, you know, we come to Mass and we take from Mass all the wisdom we learn and we go in to our domestic, our home, and then try and live it out there. But I realized the domestic church is the opposite. Actually, everybody comes from home, brings everything from home, and gifts the church with presents, um, hymns, singing, prayers. That's the domestic church at home. And you gift us by your family by coming to join the larger family. Yes. Thank you. Uh, 
Yeah, you you spoke that gathering really ties into this other question here. You spoke about the koinonia, the the gathering of the in the community and the fostering of fellowship in the in the community there. Um, and thinking of you know Paul speaking of the the church as the the body of Christ um, there that we're where we're gathered together to as parts of the body would you speak to the relationship of the church as Christ's body uh, the relation of of church as Christ's body to the presence of Christ in the Eucharist um, the elements and elsewhere in in the liturgy both terms of the Eucharist as an act of the church, you mentioned the, the masses being an act of the church, and the sending forth of the church at the end of mass to mission in the world. Another another point that you spoke. Yes. Well, you know, that's why I use the uh, expression body of Christ when people come up for communion. I know that the general uh, way is to say that this is the body of Christ. I don't say that because I want the individual to realize that he or she is the body of Christ and they become the body of Christ by, I mean, Christ is one and we all receive the same Christ, but because we all receive the Christ, Jesus, and go to our places, he's in each and every one of us. And then as a corporation, if you like, we become his body because he's present in each of us. By saying this is the body of Christ, it points to the actual host, which is, of course, the body of Christ. But it's the individual will become the body of Christ through receiving that already they're being part of the body of Christ in the assembly. So it's on different levels. And if we look also at the, like the bread and wine that is used, when we celebrate in the church, it's always at the back or in the middle of the church, brought down as gifts. And when we talk about the real presence, you know, the, the bread and wine changes significance throughout Mass, not just at the consecration. At the beginning, it is the gifts that are being prepared. Those gifts are already no longer, what we, when we see them, they're no longer bread and wine for us at that point, because they are set aside as special food for this meal. So it's not just bread, not just wine. It's food prepared for this meal. And then at the offertory, it comes up symbolizing the bread and wine symbolizes the community. The priest accepts that and then offers up. And then the consecration, we have a deeper expression of the presence of Jesus through the words of consecration. Then the communion, becoming the body of Christ through each of us receiving him. And then we the, the, the church universal then, like everybody, every Catholic throughout the world is attending that particular meal at a particular time. And all of us have had the opportunity of having the Eucharist like I did in, in Hong Kong. I was waiting for it to get on an airplane. I got into a church quickly for 6.30 mass, understood nothing, but I understood everything. And what was particularly meaningful was the sign of peace. This old lady in front of me turned and put out her hand and said to me clearly in Chinese, peace be with you. Oh, wow. You know, it's all over the world. It's the universal church. It's different to the institutional church insofar as, you know, the teaching authority and so on. This is sacramental church. And this is how people, I hope, see the presence of Jesus in our world today through the universal church, all of us, Catholics. I don't want more to add to that. That's fine. Um, but uh, related related to that um, topic, um, you talked about the, the transformation that that we have, um, and then so I um, would you speak to offering uh, the offering as a, a self gift there that we ourselves are transformed on the altar in in the transformation of the gifts and bread and wine which are the work of human hands and and you know which in the in their early church would have actually been formed by the community but now is 
you know, we symbolize through the the money that we we put in in the basket there as a as our our symbol of our gifts that we in ourselves that we lift up um, in that way. Well, you know, that's why I uh, pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable. I have some priest friends who will not say that. They will say our sacrifice, which is true. If I change it now, people say, why is he changing? <laughs> but I mean, that's what represents actually our lives, you know, our, our sacrifice. And what, what I'm offering when I offer up the wine, red wine, I'm very much aware of where I need help. I'm also aware of where I need to sacrifice more of my selfishness. And, uh, but I also, because I believe that God can transform me and I want to be transformed into the image that God has made me to be, uh, I offer that up. And you say, the, you know, the collection side is a monetary side, of course, because we have to survive. Uh, and that also is brought up, I think, at the offertory, and then it disappears into a safe. <laughs> I quite like the, the symbolism at some parishes, like we are now here, of depositing it on the way out, or in other parishes, people get out of the pews and go and put their offering in there so that it's, it's connected to the bread and the wine on the altar, and not seen as a kind of separate act. Um, so while I'm sitting there during the collection, for example, one can also think of, this is me, I'm sending that forth, forward, and what, what I need help with, how I'm doing well, thanking God for some of the gifts that I've received in life, uh, the gift of people, you know, kindness, health, whatever it may be. So uh, it's, it's not an empty, I'm not saying you're saying that, it's not an empty ritual for me at all, it's all so meaningful. Excellent. Um, so the, the mass is a gathering for a meal. Um, and often we don't eat that meal with the expectation of taking that forward to, to share with others. How might we better really enact that that aspect that it's not just us nourishing ourselves here and in the moment, but then um, be nourished to the purpose of of mission. Uh, yes, well, of course, it's in, in the the meal is not just for me, uh, so it can't be an individual act. Um, and I think that's why you know we're connected to the word. I think the word inspires or could or should inspire and that I take meaning from God's word speaking to me and then God giving, feeding me. Now I take that, those aspects together of how am I going to be different? It may, won't be a radical difference, but to me it's part of that metanoia that in the sacrament of reconciliation too, I feel the preparation is always how have I loved, how have I failed to love. And when I come to the mass, that is our loving meal, where Jesus displays and reveals the love of the Father for us in the power of his spirit to transform. And um, I ask for that guidance and help that I may look at my life somewhat differently when I leave and put into practice kindness, helping people who need some hope, um, and all the different facets of what ministry entails, because we minister after that. It's not just the priest who does the ministering. We minister to the body of Christ, the, the wounded side. I think that's why St. Paul said, you know, we make up for the, uh, what is not saying that Jesus' sacrifice was not enough. He says, but we participate in that, in the sacrifices we make. And we participate then in becoming aware 
of the contribution we make for the salvation of all, not just ourselves, but others too, and the world. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then um, this this question here is, is related to some of the other kind of questions that we, we've had going on. Um, the, the Western church, Roman Catholics and Protestants are tend to be more paschally focused, you know, focused on the, the death and resurrection of, of Jesus. Whereas the Eastern church, Orthodox and Eastern Catholic churches tend to be more incarnationally focused on, on the divine word becoming one of us. It's not that it either ignores the other, but we have kind of an orientation and an emphasis in, in our, um, in our theology and our spirituality. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the Eastern church really um, talks about that, introduced that notion of theosis, the idea that even without original sin, um, the divine become one of us and Jesus would have come to, to be part of us in order to lift us up to a, a, a higher state so that we're not really just being um, restored to the state before original sin, but actually lift up something higher that we would have been lifted up to anyway, even without our original sin. Um, I wondered if you might speak to that sort of incarnational, the incarnational focus instead of just the paschal focus that as it might appear in the mass and, um, and that sort of lifting us up, that related to, uh, I'm throwing a few things at you, <laughs> when you can kind of draw connections however you want, but that related to the various ways Christ is present in the mass, mm -hmm. the, the community and the presider and, and the word and the elements that are transformed. And uh, Augustine's famous quote from, from his sermon, I think it's 272, uh, become what you see and receive what you are, right? When in the, the taking of the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. um, I, you, you, can, you can use what you want from that and you can talk <laughs> the rest of it, but if you might draw some connections um, between some of those. Yes, St. Augustine influenced me to say body of Christ rather than this is the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, as you said, he said, receive what you are and then become what you receive. Yeah, and I think the emphasis that uh, we have in our tradition has always been on the sacrament. Um, I attended an ecumenical service when I was a first year student in the seminary. Uh, it was just at the time of Vatican II. And our rector was um, asked to do, be part of a service in the Episcopal Church. Um, so the, he got up and he said, I, I want to thank the Protestant tradition for keeping the word of God alive and for helping us as Catholics, as we have now in the council, he said, understood better how powerful the word of God is and how God actually does speak to us in a very incarnational way through the word, words that are mouthed and proclaimed um, to our hearts. And I have not, I've never forgotten that because I think the study of scripture is so beautiful. And I'm glad that the Vatican II actually brought that into its own prominence. That's why we walk down with a book. It's not just a book, it's the word of God. And why we have a special place, you know, for, for, the, for the gospel, the word. Well, at the same um, celebration, then the um, uh, there was a Presbyterian minister got up and then he said, I want to thank the Roman Catholic tradition for keeping alive the Eucharist for us. We have neglected that over the years and to see how powerful it is as an expression of who we are as a Christian people. So isn't it wonderful that we now can actually see the both the word and sacrament. I mean, the sacrament, the word itself is a sacrament. That's why I refer to the proclamation rather than reading. We can all read, but we want to proclaim. 
fascinating for me. I know some people who actually learn the readings by heart so that they don't have the printed text in front of them. And there was a wedding recently that I did where the bridegroom's sister read, did, did not the reading, but she proclaimed without text St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, some of the letters to the Corinthians. So I think we found a balance as Catholics. And um, if you look at all scripture scholars in our world today, I would say that the majority are Catholic. But also when I studied Mariology in the seminary, our basic text was a text written by a Lutheran. And it was beautiful um, on Mariology and what she represents. So I think we never know enough. We're always learning and we're always moving forward um, through the inspiration that God provides by his word and also for us to become so aware of his presence in the sacrament and other words. Well, thank you. And thank you so much for the time that you've taken to do this presentation for us, um, sharing with us. And we um, we're very grateful that that you um, that you have um, shared so much so richly with us. Well, it's we will end in prayer yeah. in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. God, thank you for this opportunity for us to gather together as we gather in fellowship at the Mass. We thank you for. Um, helping us greater, better understand the great mystery that indeed is revealed in the Eucharist and have, giving us a richer sense of your son's presence there in all aspects and our sense opportunity to grow in holiness through the experience of the Mass. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And I thank all of you, my family, and it was a pleasure to be with you. <laughs> Thank you.